Well, as of Wednesday, the final pen pal letter has been sent, and Vice Chancellor Zern will go back into analyzing the settlement, and hopefully we will get a final conclusion to this whole ordeal. And while we're waiting, perhaps maybe it should be time to take a look at the homework assignment that Vice Chancellor Zern gave the parties and their responses to the homework assignment to get sort of a glimpse, perhaps, into what lies ahead in the future. So in her response to clarify the Rose Izzo motion, Vice Chancellor Zern went ahead and gave the parties four tasks to complete. One of them's not really worth discussing because it's simply getting Mr. Munez out of the whole settlement because he's no longer a party. And the other three are the ones that we're going to need to go over. One, that the parties need to kind of give Vice Chancellor Zern a time frame on when they need this taken care of. When, what, what, what's the window given AMC's financial situation that Vice Chancellor Zern needs to get this ruling out? Um, because they've been kind of fuzzy about what the financial situation is and last she had been told they needed this kind of out before the end of August. The second thing she asked was an opinion from both of the parties, either jointly or separately, on how Coster affects the breach of fiduciary duty claims that the plaintiff brought. Since that is kind of its own tangled web of confusing, messy legalness, we're going to save that one for the end. And finally, Vice Chancellor Zern requested a response to Rose Izzo's preemptive motion for a request for a stay on lifting the status quo order, pending an appeal if the settlement is approved. So let's deal with the financial situation and timetable first. When I first saw plaintiff's letter on this matter, I kind of had to roll my eyes. Plaintiffs cannot speak directly to AMC's now current business needs regarding the timing of the proposed settlement. Weren't you the one saying that you looked at AMC's financials and decided that settlement was the best option? You can't speak on any of that. Heck, maybe you should at this point because you couldn't even speak to it at the settlement hearing when the court directly asked you about it. And this continues to be my problem, that plaintiffs just refuse to do their job at the most inconvenient moments for progressing this lawsuit. That isn't to say that they are doing the wrong thing. It's just, could you please do maybe what you think the right thing is better earn your paycheck since you're apparently going to be getting millions of dollars in this settlement. I almost had the same eye-rolling disgust for AMC's lawyers when they gave their information about what sort of timetable and financial situation they were wanting and working with. At first, their letter sort of dusted over the financials, demurred on telling the court what their timetable might be, and gave a news article about the writers and actors strike. And it just, again, seems so cursory. But at least they went the extra mile and followed up with financial statements to put those on the record in point two to show what sort of problems they're dealing with to back up their arguments. And, you know, do the thing that Vice Chancellor Zern asked the plaintiffs to. Where in the record is the problem that requires this settlement? Oh, here it is. Thanks, defendants, for doing the plaintiffs' work for them. And as we turn to the Rose Izzo matter of putting a stay on lifting the status quo order, it is again the defendants that are doing the heavy lifting on this matter. And quite possibly because they're the ones that have the most at stake here. If this doesn't go through, it's, it's bankruptcy. I mean, I, I've already talked about this on, on multiple occasions on this channel. Instead of giving a few paragraphs dealing with the four-part standard for getting a stay or a preliminary injunction of, or anything of that nature, AMC and its lawyers dedicates a whole letter unto itself, which thoroughly goes over each issue point by point. And that's the one I'm going to reference for this. If you've been on this channel and listened to the Judge Jones video or even a much older subscriber all the way back to the AVCT videos, you already know the four-part standard for preliminary injunctions and stays. AMC also outlines it in their letter. The four-part test is one, to make a preliminary assessment of the likelihood of success on the merits. Two, 
to assess whether the petitioner will suffer irreparable injury if the stay is not granted. Three, the balancing of equities in the matter of the stay. Does the stay harm the affected party more than it would help the movement? And four, to determine the overall public interest. AMC's lawyers are quick to point out that Rosizzo's counsel and their arguments have already been dealt with by the court and that the court agreed with both the parties that Rose Izzo misapprehends the settlement. Not only that, but I'll also add that this was not just the opinion of the court. It was the opinion of the court and the court's officers. Both Vice Chancellor Zern and Special Master Amato reviewed this argument and found it to be lacking, which would make it really hard to appeal, especially given the standard that the Supreme Court of Delaware holds on this matter. As AMC's legal team points out, upon review, an appellate court does not relitigate the case. The deferential abuse of discretion standard is what is applied. And from one of this channel's favorite ditties, Con v. Sullivan, AMC's lawyers quote that for the Delaware Supreme Court to set aside a settlement which has been found by the Court of Chancery to be fair and reasonable, the evidence in the record must be so strongly to the contrary that the approval of the settlement constitutes an abuse of discretion, and that has not been proven by Izzo's counsel. Then, in one of the biggest legal backhands I have seen in a while, AMC's lawyers point out that money damages is not irreparable harm, because funny enough, if you are harmed monetarily, the other party can simply, on appeal, pay you the damages. They also point out that compliance with the court's order and potential mootness of the appeal is not a factor that weighs in favor of a movement on a stay of any court order pending appeal. And AMC rolls in points three and four together. After all, they're really tightly connected. If AMC had this stay order placed upon it and couldn't access financial markets, it would be very likely that it would go bankrupt, and that would harm them more than it would help Izzo. On top of that, looking at it from a public good aspect, if the stay was implemented, that would harm shareholders. Their value as shareholders would be completely liquidated in bankruptcy. Not only that, but you have to think of the employees, all the different people who have reliant contracts with AMC, the movie companies, and other individuals that all have financial connections with AMC that would be harmed in a bankruptcy hearing. That does not serve the public interest at all, let alone the shareholders. So on all four counts, it's just not good news for Izzo because the arguments were weak. And then finally, what I think is the most important part is when Vice Chancellor Zern asked the parties their opinion on the Coster situation. Now, if you're not aware of the ruling in Coster, that's okay. That is a complicated situation that is probably a video unto itself as far as the legal ramifications, what all happened with that case and everything. So I'm just going to provide some links in the description that you can peruse at your own time to help you understand things. All you need to know really for the basics is that more or less what Coster did was sort of move where the court was wanting to move anyway. And that is a unified intermediate standard of review when it comes to these sort of corporate actions, fiduciary duties that has to deal with corporate control and the board of directors. The problem with this is the two standards, Blasius, which uh, is what is the framework of the AMC lawsuit, and Unical are not exactly the same thing and don't exactly cover the same ground. L let me explain. Unical has to deal with mergers and acquisitions, specifically hostile takeovers. You know, that big thing back in the 80s when this lawsuit actually happened, where corporate raiders would come in try and buy out a company, and then gut it. Unical was subject to such an attempt by Mesa Petroleum. They tried to do a deal where they were going to offer $54 in cash per share or dump people with a bunch of junk bonds with the same value if they had to kick down the door and drag everyone out screaming. So Unical made a 
offer of $72 a share. And originally, the Delaware Court of Chancery shot that down, but upon appeal to the Delaware Supreme Court, that ruling was overturned, setting us up for the Unical test, which is if the directors re reasonably perceived a threat of a hostile takeover and perceived it correctly, were the defensive measures reasonable in retaliation to the threat posed? So depending on the situation, a company could respond in a manner that it felt is appropriate, say in the case of Unical here, but say like something like Twitter, where shareholders would actually benefit from the hostile takeover attempt by Musk, though it's questionable if the user base has benefited, would probably not hold up in the, under the Unical standard if Twitter's executives tried to block it. And this is meant to protect against the board trying to preserve its own personal power over the company at the expense of what is good for shareholders. Certain buyouts and acquisition attempts, even if they're hostile, could benefit shareholders. And the board shouldn't stop those just because they have their own interests in mind. Blasius covers some of the same ground in the aspect of proxy votes and direct director elections to the board of directors. Remember in Blasius, as we've discussed, the board of directors added two new members to the board in an attempt to thwart a shareholder proxy vote to enlarge and then add a bunch of new board members, which would have diluted out the current power that the current members of the board of directors possessed. On face value, both of these seem to gel just fine and you can put them together in a reasonable standard that overall deals with corporate power vested in the board of directors that seems to thwart shareholders um, as far as their actual ownership of the company. Remember, the real owners are the shareholders and the board of directors are fiduciaries for those owners. Except until you start actually looking at the ruling in Blasius. The issue with Blasius in this situation is the difference between the ruling in Blasius, the words, the situation, the case itself, and the spirit of that ruling. And you can see it throughout Chancellor Allen's opinion. It isn't just about a case where you had a corporate entity, the board of directors, abusing its power, even if it did it in the best interests it believed of the company, and not selfishly, but disenfranchised the shareholders who are the actual owners of the company. And you can see it time and time again throughout the ruling, Chancellor Allen's opinion, not only of that, but of the shareholder franchise in general. And this even shows up in the citations that AMC proffers for its own opinion on how the situation in Coster should be interpreted. Vice Chancellor Lamb in NRE Money Group Incorporated, which AMC cites, does point out exactly what AMC says, that the framework for Blasius draws its context from the specific situation in this case. The fact that the board of directors abused its power to block the shareholder franchise. But Vice Chancellor Lamb correctly points out that this does not block other contexts in which the shareholder vote is disfranchised by a board of directors. It may not be in every instance, and the court should take more scrutiny when considering these other matters, but when a faithless fiduciary acts to deprive shareholders of a full and fair opportunity to participate in the matter and to thwart what appears to be the will of the majority of stockholders, then Blasius does apply, regardless of if the board of directors being voted on or continuing their term or maintaining their power has nothing to do with the vote in question. And that brings us back around to the AMC situation and why they take the first part of Vice Chancellor Lamb's opinion and kind of just don't mention the second part. Because 65% of shareholders, common, AMC common shareholders, didn't vote, AMC had to construct this artifice to get this to pass. And it makes plaintiff's arguments a lot better considering all of this because those 65% of shareholders that didn't vote, that basically abstained, you can never really tell if this whole artifice that AMC constructed was against their will. 
it's an argument made for plaintiffs that possibly could have worked if it wasn't for the fact that AMC has some financial problems that made it pretty clear that there was a reason why AMC was doing this, which is what we're dealing with here with Vice Chancellor Zern. She is, in my opinion, going to take her time with this. AMC kind of roughed out a deadline that they'd hoped to get this done before about middle of August, before preferably sooner rather than later. But I have a feeling Vice Chancellor Zern will take that full time, if not maybe a little bit more. I don't see it going past August. Because Vice Chancellor Zern has to look at this from the perspective of setting Delaware Court of Chancery precedent. Costner has taken the letter of Blasius and merged it up there with Unical and this new standard. And the question now is, what about the spirit of Blasius? Does that get absorbed into Coster and disappear into the ether forever? That this is just a matter that only deals with corporate direct elections and corporate control and has nothing to do with the overall general shareholder vote? The right of a shareholder to have effect on the company that they supposedly own? Or is there a new sort of standard that needs to be uh, fashioned, like a Blasius 2.0, that deals directly with the general shareholder franchise? This is the issue before Vice Chancellor Zern, and why she requested from both the plaintiffs and the defendants, or them jointly, to add their contribution as to how they see the current situation with Costner. Because before this is all said and done, she needs to figure out where this lays. And for all the people that think that she's going to quickly ascertain her ruling in this with potential future ramification for years and maybe decades to come, uh, they're going to be disappointed. You're going to be hearing about this lawsuit a lot because it's going to be cited a lot in future cases when determining what happens in the post-Coster era with general shareholder franchise. And that's all I've got. Hopefully this was helpful. I know that this was, again, rather long. But I think it's important because a lot of people last Friday got blindsided by Vice Chancellor Zern's ruling. And I can't help but say, I told you so. So hopefully this video will help you understand where things are going forward. And you don't get blindsided again next time she speaks. Till next time, I'll catch you all later.